Hey Grace Family Church, how are you guys doing? Wherever you're watching from, um, I wanted to say a little how's it. Would you let us know where you're watching from? Let yeah. us know in the comments. Um, we want to know, right? Um, introduce yourself, maybe just get the chats flowing um, because it's so good to be with you guys once again online. I won't lie guys, this is my favorite spot to be. So, hey, um, Nick, it's good, good to, to have you. Just a couple of announcements. We are going to get straight into the message this morning. But before we do, uh, we've got the Global Leadership Summit wow. coming up in October. We want to let you know about this. And this year, we're taking a bit of a different approach at Grace for the first time in many many years we're actually not going to be hosting the GLS physically at any of our campuses but we are encouraging all of our people all of our staff are going to be attending at the local host sites around Durban and so we invite you to join this amazing yeah. GLS experience it's going to be happening on the 20th or the 27th you can choose in October um, at various locations I'm Schlanger Harvest Church Durban Christian Center a link church in Belito and so you can find out the details additionally if you want to participate in uh, from the comfort of your homes then also they're going to be offering an online option which is amazing and it's just a chance to immerse yourself in a day of inspiration incredible leadership insights uh, from around the world from some of the greatest leaders around the world uh, so don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to be part of GLS around our city but also online and just another little note quickly we are offering discount codes to Grace Family Church members uh, which you can find in the link below and the discount code will be there as well and so don't miss out Indeed, and listen Tom, I won't lie, um, it's been awesome to partner with the GLS team and just kind of work with them and it's been awesome. I'm excited for what's to come, so you yep. want to get, you want to be there, right? So, awesome. we in our week four of Why is the Bible So? And we've got Jess is going to be joining us, so why don't you take a look? Hi everyone, this is Garth. And this is Paul. And we're going to answer some questions that you may have answered and Garth's going to ask me and I'm going to ask him. So let's go. This is going to be excellent. <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah, I've got no idea. We're, we're going to figure it out. All right, is it my turn for you, Paul? Let's Why go. is the Bible so written in verses? I'm having to read it upside down, but written in verses. Yeah, I was verses. impressed that you read that upside down. Yeah, written in verses. I, I thought you were going to ask me to sing. <laughs> written in verses. I'm not singing in verse. Okay. I just can't do that. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah. You should Google that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, uh, Garth, uh, why is the Bible so... Oh, this is long. Look how long this one is. You're in trouble. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, this is difficult. Why is the Bible called the Word of God? By the way, small g meant to be big G. It's fine. Google gets it wrong. Look, my nickname is Big G, by big the way. G. But now we're not talking Big G. Um, why is the, wo the Word of God... Yo, we get it wrong. Uh, I've got it wrong many times. But I think the more you dig into it, the more you find out that maybe it is big G and not small G. Sure. I mean, we all have questions about the Bible. I want to know why it's so expensive. Because you know, the guys who wrote it are not getting that money, right? They're all dead. <laughs> I have found that over the years, um, my relationship with the Bible has been a lot like that of a child and her parents. You, you kind of start out thinking that they know everything and they've got the answer in there. You can just rely and depend on them. And then you kind of go through that teenage stage. And, and I remember going through the scriptures and realizing that some of my favorite Bible stories from when I was a little girl are just full of violence and xenophobia and genocide and it's really disappointing it's like a teenager who suddenly becomes aware of her parents faults and flaws and i i went through a stage where i felt disappointed in the bible kind of let down by it but over the last decade or so i've learned a new way to approach the bible i've, I've tried to find a different set of expectations and I'm learning to relate to the Bible more like an adult child relates to her parents. In a way that honors and respects the Bible for what it is, not what I want it to be. The Bible isn't an answer book. It isn't a self-help book. It isn't a science or a history textbook. It isn't even a single book. But it's an ancient collection of letters and laws, of prophecies and proverbs, of stories and songs. And, and this collection spans thousands of years. It's written in languages 
and cultures and contexts that are really far removed from my own. And so, yes, the Bible can be so weird or confusing, or, uh, but what we've been doing is looking at honoring the Bible for what it is, not for what we want it to be. My hope for you is that the Bible is a conversation starter, not a conversation ender. And so today, what kind of conversation are we going to have with the Bible? After reading this weird Bible story, you may have a question that is similar to the one you ask about your own life. And that is this. Where is God? Maybe you ask this question after you've read a story in the news or you've listened to the radio or you have a text from a friend. Maybe you ask, where is God when you read the Bible? Now, that would be something that you might find in your life or in this Bible story. But what they have in common is this. None of them mention God. Yep. This is the book of Esther. Esther is the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God. And yet, there it is. Part of the greatest story ever told. Today, I'm going to attempt to give you kind of a bird's eye view of this book. It would probably take you about 25 minutes to read it from cover to cover. We don't even have that long. We could do a whole 10 week series on this. I'd Definitely, I'm not going to be able to do it all justice today. But I do think what we cover today can be a conversation starter. So, when you're done here, when you're finished listening to this, which of these three conversations are you going to have? Maybe this week you'll have a conversation between you and the Bible. Maybe you're going to go away and you're going to read the book of Esther. Highly recommend read it in the message version. It is like better than a Netflix series. <laughs> Maybe you'll have a conversation with someone else that you share this with, who listens to it or you send it to them. And, and the two of you kind of say, well, what resonated for you? What stood out? And, and it'll get a conversation going where you can learn from someone else and they can learn from you. But most of all, what I hope, is at the end of our time together, you'll have a conversation with God. You see, this book, where God seems invisible, has a way of making God visible to us. If we come to it with curiosity and humility and hunger, and perhaps God might fill in some of the silent blank spaces for you in your life through this weird and wonderful story of Esther. So here is the plot and the purpose of the book of Esther. And we, we, so often we get stuck on the plot. Instead of getting stuck on the specifics of an unusual story or something that's confusing, and this is a technique for anywhere in the Bible, don't get stuck on the plot. Look for the purpose. The reason why these details were included. Now, the plot of Esther is that there's a character, uh, she has a context. We see this kind of climax, this big turning point, and then a conclusion. But the purpose is that the character reveals something about presence. The context reveals something about persecution. The climax reveals something about power. And the conclusion speaks to us about perfection. And when we read strange, confusing stories in the Bible where the context is so different to ours, we can focus on the purpose of the message and find the meaning. So let's begin with the character. Today in Esther, we meet a child. Maybe you didn't know, but Esther was actually probably between 12 and 14 years old. She was like in grade eight when this story happened. It took place in 483 BC in what was then called Persia, but is southwest Iran today. This is what we read. Mordecai had brought up Hadassah. We're going to come back to the meanings of her names. That is Esther, his cousin. 
Why did he have to raise her? Because she had neither father nor mother. The girl was fair and beautiful and when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. So we have this young Jewish girl, like beginning of high school age, and somewhere in the political turmoil of the ancient Near East, she's been orphaned, probably through genocide or war, and she's being raised by her cousin. Now, what is so significant here is that her Jewish name was Hadassah. Hadassah means myrtle tree, and the myrtle tree was a symbol. It was a symbol of peace and kindness and joy and justice. That was her true identity and name. But she was known in her new country as Esther. And Esther means hidden, concealed. You see, this young girl's identity, her, her, her character, even her story and her purpose were not seen by those around her. No one really knew her. No one knew what, what she was capable of or, or who she was that was hidden. And so the first conversation starter that Esther gives us is that could there be something present, something true and kind and just that is hidden? Maybe in your life, it feels like God is invisible. Like you, you can't see what he's really capable of. It. Esther gives us an opportunity to discover that even when we can't see him, he's working. So we see the character of Esther, but let's read on and we get to the context. Now, what is actually happening in this book, in this story? And the short answer is a lot. <laughs> There is this wild, impulsive, powerful, drunken king called Xerxes and he rules Asia from India down into Ethiopia. I mean, that's basically the known world. And King Xerxes needs a new queen. Now, the reason he needs a queen is because one night the king and all his friends had been on a seven day drinking binge, classy, and uh, he demands that his current queen, Queen Vashti, come and dance naked for him and his friends. Uh, she refuses, and, and some scholars believe it's because it's not the first time she was asked to do this. Because she refuses, she is permanently banned, and basically King Xerxes needs to replace her. And so he sends out what is essentially a human hunt for beautiful young girls. We read in Esther 2. So, when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered, I'm going to come back to that word, but just listen to the language in the scripture. Many young women were gathered in the citadel of Susa. In the custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who had charge of the woman. Guys, this was not a beauty pageant. This is not The Bachelor, where all the pretty single young girls come out and try and compete. This was actually a lot more like human trafficking. It was more like a Liam Neeson in Taken situation. These little girls, they weren't volunteering. They were being corralled and collected and, and taken from their presence. And so the context of this story is persecution. It's suffering. It's pain. Esther's nation, the Jews, were in exile in Persia. They'd been captured from their homeland. Her parents were dead. She was taken from her home. She becomes objectified property, dehumanized and treated of nothing as nothing of value other than her function. Now, maybe your situation doesn't feel as dramatic as that, but I'm sure you know what it's like to feel taken advantage of, to feel like your situation is, is, is unfair, is stacked up against you. Maybe it's suffering or loss. And maybe you're wondering, what do I do when I'm persecuted? What do I do when I'm taken up or held captive by the circumstances in my life? Well, 
the conversation that Esther leads us towards is really surprising because this is how she responds to how she's treated. The girl pleased him. They're referring to her guy, the eunuch. And just pressing pause here for a minute, the eunuchs were, uh, I don't have time to get into it, but they were also men who had been dehumanized and had suffered in the, in the context, in the culture of the day. They would have been hardened, jaded, cynical men who've been traumatized. But somehow, and we read on, this young girl Esther won his favor. And he quickly provided her with cosmetic treatments and her portion of food. He, he humanizes her. He sees her, gives her dignity. And with seven chosen maids from the king's palace, where she didn't have anything, she now has community, he advanced her and her maids to the best place in the harem. And here's the thing that we see from Esther, is that despite persecution, or actually, maybe even because of her suffering, her true colors come out. Remember what her true identity is, kindness and joy and peace and justice. And somehow this young girl actually gains the trust and draws kindness out of these men, out of, in this harsh environment. Now, the, the phrase here, Nasa Hased, is the original Hebrew for won his favor. And it's only found in the book of Esther. You see, nasa means to gain or take, and hased means kindness. Esther gained kindness. Now, a theologian, Michael Fox, this is what he says. This idiom, he's talking about nasa hased, found only in Esther, so holds a suggestion of activeness in gaining, rather than the idiom has, usual idiom has, of finding kindness. Gaining kindness, this is so important, Gaining kindness is something she is doing rather than something that is being done to her. In persecution, Esther is not a victim. Cruelty or kindness are not things that are done to her, but she takes an active role of drawing out the goodness and the kindness in other people, despite her own suffering, her own loss. She actually reveals her true self, Hadassah, the joy, the kindness, the peace, and manages to get kindness out of people around her. Maybe that's the conversation you want to sit with. Okay, so now we get to the climax of the story. This is like, you know, if, there was, if this was a Netflix series, this is where they would end it and then tell you that season two is only coming out in 2024. This is the turning point. This is where the plot just suddenly speeds up and everything happens. So a conflict arises on the streets of the city of Susa. Susa, by the way, is still there. It's one of the world's longest inhabited cities. Um, on the streets of the city, Esther's cousin Mordecai has refused to bow down to one of the king's recently promoted advisors, a man named Haman. Haman has just been promoted. His ego is huge. He's taking up a lot of room. He's throwing his weight around and he is furious that this foreigner, this immigrant, won't bow down to him, won't respect him. And he goes on a very complex, anti-Semitic, vengeful plan to basically decimate all the Jewish people in Xerxes' kingdom, which, remember, is like from India to Ethiopia, almost the whole ancient world. Basically, if we put it in modern-day terms, there's a new politician in government and he's planning a genocide. No one knows that the highly principled Jewish man that was at the center of this series of events is the new queen's cousin. But in a highly dangerous and risky series of events, Esther and Mordecai come up with a plan to save their people. This plan to rescue a nation, it requires this young queen to put her life on the line. The cost is so high. She has to be willing to lay aside her, her newly found security, her newly found position. She has to give up her, her safety and finally her, her, her sense of place in the world as the queen. She even has to 
potentially ruin her reputation and reveal her Jewish identity. People hated Jewish people at the time. She has to reveal that and be willing to die to save her people. So we jump back into this, this story, this everything is on the line rescue operation. So the king and Haman went to dinner with Queen Esther. At the second dinner, while they were drinking wine, king basically is never sober, uh, the king asked Queen Esther, what would you like? Half my kingdom. Can you just picture this drunk guy going like, what do you want? I can do it. I can do anything you want. He's showing off. His ego is out of control. He says, just ask. Just ask and it's yours. Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your eyes, O king, if it please the king, just give me my life. Give my people their lives. We've been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, sold to be massacred, eliminated. If we had just been sold off into slavery, I wouldn't even have brought it up. Our troubles wouldn't have been worth bothering the king over. King Xerxes exploded. Who? Where is he? This is monstrous. An enemy? An adversary, this evil Haman, said Esther. Haman was terror-stricken before the king and queen. The king, raging, left his wine, and you must know he's upset if he left his wine behind, guys, stomped off into the palace garden. Haman stood there pleading with Queen Esther for his life. He could see the king was finished with him and that he was doomed. As the king came back from the palace garden into the banquet hall, Haman was groveling. I'm sorry, but that is just so satisfying. The he is just groveling at the couch. You know, Esther's reclining. I love Esther. She's like kicking back. She's like, dude, you are done. The king roared out. Will he even molest the queen while I'm just around the corner? When that word left the king's mouth, all the blood drained from Haman's face. Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, and I, I have... I like to imagine that Harbona has been waiting for this moment his whole life. He spoke up. Look over there, he points out to the king. He's like, what a coincidence. There's the gallows Haman had built for Mordecai. Mordecai who saved the king's life. It's right next to Haman's house, 75 feet high. And the king picks up what <laughs> Harbona is putting down and he says, hang him on it. And this is so key here. What the scripture says. So Haman was hanged on the very gallows he had built for Mordecai. You see, at the climax of this story, the most important point is revealed. The theologian Rachel Held Evans describes this moment by saying this, power, the author seems to be saying, is ultimately an illusion. What we see happen between Mordecai and Haman is this inversion. Because in this story, the weak are made strong. In this story, the refugee becomes royalty. In this story, the systems and structures of this world are turned upside down by the lowly, by the no ones, by the disenfranchised, by the oppressed. And so we see here in the book of Esther, the kingdom of God's version of power and what we should do with it. How the kingdom of God's version of power is so different to this world's version of power. What will you do with power? Maybe you feel like you don't have any. Maybe you feel like you're the silenced, you're the lonely, you're the oppressed. May this story bring you hope. Or maybe you have influence. Maybe you have power. Maybe you have position and privilege. What we see in Esther, and I hope this will inspire you, is that instead of power being used to enslave, it's used to set people free. Instead of power being used selfishly, it's used for service. Through suffering, through sacrifice, through those in power, with power, like Esther, with maybe even the power that she hasn't had before. When she gives it up, justice is restored and wrongs are made right. And like Rachel Hold Evans says, in the end, it is God 
who uses the weak to humble the powerful. It is God who makes all things new. And so, where does this plot, where does this purpose land us? Well, the conclusion of Esther's story is sadly not the conclusion of a perfect story. In fact, if you read on, you'll see that Esther goes on to exact a very violent genocide of her own against anyone who's harmed the Jewish nation. And as I read that, it occurred to me, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that a traumatized young orphan girl who is abused, who's taken advantage of, wouldn't have her own dark wounds and shadows. Esther, Esther didn't even want to put her life on the line. Her cousin had to beg her. But when he did, this is what he said. Maybe you were made queen. Maybe you were put in this position. Maybe you find yourself in these circumstances for such a time as this. The conclusion of the story is that there are no perfect circumstances. There are no perfect plans. But there is God's perfect timing. I don't know what your circumstances are. I don't know how your plans are coming along. But maybe you're asking, what do I do? What do I do next? How do I know what to do? How do I know what God's plan for my life is? My prayer is that Esther will start a conversation for you where you see that your choices don't have to be perfect, but God is. When Tom and I were preparing to move overseas, someone wise said to Tom, Tom, it's not like there's three doors and, and God's hiding behind one of them and you have to choose it. Esther reminds us that there's no perfect plan, but God's timing is perfect. Esther wasn't a beauty queen. She was a voiceless no one. She wasn't a fearless savior. She was a vulnerable child. She wasn't someone better or braver or bolder than you and me. Rachel Held Evans says Esther was just an ordinary person who under extraordinary circumstances rises to the occasion of living out her best self, her Hadassah, her true nature. And when she does that, she becomes God's hands and voice in the world. Maybe you just feel like an ordinary person in extraordinary circumstances. But when we surrender to God's perfect hand, perfect timing, we become God's voice and God's hands in the world. So here's the truth about the book of Esther. It's not about her. The plot is about Esther. But the purpose is Jesus. Esther's story is a foretelling, a pattern, a prediction of Jesus. Because it's not about Esther's presence that was hidden, but it is about how God will always reveal his true nature at the perfect time. Even when we don't see him, he's working. Just as Esther had to weigh up the cost of giving up her privilege and her position and her power and sacrifice herself to save her people, Jesus did that perfectly. Jesus gave up his power, his position, his reputation to save us. And this story of a people being saved doesn't happen because Esther is perfect, but with her broken, flawed, wounded self, she submits herself in obedience to God's perfect will. And so this is how we're going to end off. For the next 30 seconds or so, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to give you space to have a conversation with God. Maybe it's about something in a worship song that you've heard, or maybe it's about something that's been said today. But won't you pay attention in this silence and solitude and see where God is working? Won't you bring your story, your questions to this moment? 
And so we're going to put two questions up on the screen. You can let it play for the next 30 seconds. You can press pause and pray for longer if you need to. But I want to encourage you to come to God and say, God, what do you want me to pay attention to? Think back over our time together now. What stood out? What resonated? And then the second question I'd like you to ask God is to say, God, what do you want me to do? I don't know your circumstances. I'm not going to tell you how to apply this sermon to your life. But I do believe that if you listen to the whisper of God, He will help you and speak to you and show you what to do next. Let's take a moment to pray. When you're ready, you can come back from that moment of reflection. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are always working, even when we don't see it, even when we're not paying attention, even when we don't make perfect choices, even when we don't really understand what's going on. You are faithful, you are present, you are good, and you are at work. And as we sit and reflect on this story of Esther, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. For those of us who are feeling discouraged and alone, we would see your presence. For those of us who feel like we are struggling and suffering and are being persecuted, God, may we experience your kindness not from our circumstances, but from you. Will you be our source? God, as we, we look at this world around us and we wonder what is it that you want us to do, I pray that we would be obedient to your will, that we would sacrifice what we have and say yes to you and see lives transformed, including ours. We thank you that you are a good God, that you are making a way where there seems to be no May we catch a glimpse of that through this story and through ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my
my soul Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those thoughts Get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song You know, I won't lie. I love um, the questions that Jess has just given us over there. You know, just so powerful. So, just some food for thought. Maybe in the week to come, yeah. would you maybe just kind of maybe ask yourself these questions? You know, maybe um, you ask God, God, what do you want me to pay attention to? Yeah, I love that. You know, and secondly, would you maybe say, God, what do you want me to do? Brilliant. You know, and then apply those action steps as you go into the week. Yeah, I love that. I really love those questions. I love the message. And I love the worship. Uh, if you are into worship, if that's something you really enjoy, uh, just a reminder, you can head over to our, our, our YouTube worship playlist. And we have a whole bunch of songs on there. We've got some new songs. We've got new songs coming out. And if you like to continue to worship and you can worship, what I love about it is you can worship wherever you are, whenever you are, in your, in your car, whether you're at home, watching exactly. on the TV, whatever it is. Um, one of the ways we also get to worship as a community uh, is through our tithes and offering. Uh, we, we, we like to say we bring our tithes and offering. It's not about giving. Actually, it's about bringing what already belongs to God. God says everything you have ultimately comes from me. And what, I, what I'm asking you is to, you know, work with the 90 and trust me with the 10. And uh, that's always been a principle that is, you know, for us, Jess and I, have we've been doing that for, for our whole lives, really. Um, and we've seen incredible blessings um, as God has been, you know, He says, test me on this yeah. and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven. And so if you are a regular member of Grace, if you're a regular giver, we want to say thank you so much for participating in the mission that God has called us to. Because it's not about, uh, it's about, you know, not just about us, it's actually about the impact that we can have yeah. far beyond Grace Family Church. And you are part of that as you give and as you worship through our tithes and offerings. So thank you, the details will be on the screen. You can also check out the link, go to our website, and uh, all the details are there. You can give EFT via Zappa, however, whatever works for you. Indeed, thank you very much, Tom. Such a special moment, eh? And so maybe, you want, maybe you've got questions, you know, maybe you want to connect, uh, maybe there's something that was spoken about and you want to just kind of get more answers or you've got questions that you want to ask, feel free to hit us, um, hit us an email at digital at grace.org.za um, and someone will get back to you because here's the thing guys, it's more than just now when you're watching. We yeah. want to be with you um, during your week, on the weekend, wherever you are. So feel free to connect with us and we will get back to you as soon as we can, right? Yeah. Um, but here's the thing, maybe this message over here was impactful and you enjoyed it and you know someone else could enjoy or benefit from this. Yeah. So would you share this message, right? Would you maybe just share it to someone, like it, get the word out there, guys. And here's the thing, it's so easy. You know, it's, been, it's never been easier to get the word out there. And here's the thing, maybe you find something else in the previous sermons 
do the same thing, right? Subscribe so that you know what's happening, um, when our next videos will be coming out, because we want you to be in the loop with everything that's happening. Awesome, and there's so much exciting things happening, uh, both in person yeah. and online at Grace Family Church, and uh, we're so glad that you joined us today. Thank you for that. Hope it was helpful, hope it was hopeful, yeah. and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers, guys. Bye.